Good morning. Good morning. How often uh, can you uh, speak in your own native language at KubeCon? Um, welcome to our story about taming tactical cluster federation in edge conditions. At the edge, my name is uh, Stefan van Gastel, and I am proud to be uh, working for the Dutch Ministry of Defense. Hi, and my name is Anna Kosak, and I'm a lead developer at Helin Data right now. But uh, last year we did this work together with Stefan uh, when I worked at TNO. Thanks. And credit where credit is due. We have tried and built these developments and experiments uh, we're going to talk about as a team. Some of these team members can also be spotted here at KubeCon, probably on the solution showcase floor, replenishing their yearly supply of socks and t-shirts. And a small disclaimer before we start, we're going to talk about future developments and that we are already experimenting, uh, researching and testing. Uh, at times, we will be deliberately vague and incomplete for obvious reasons. Moving on. Before we get into the nerdy candy, I want to briefly take you through the rationale for this story. The Dutch Ministry of Defense, or MOD for short, is a diverse and versatile organization. We focus on high technology and low labor intensiveness. We're a small country, um, as you might have seen, um, but we have an Air Force, Army, Navy, and what we call Marche Unfortunately, there is no English translation for the latter, but think of it as a, amongst other tasks, a military police and security force. I also want to challenge the English speaking um, uh, guests to pronounce Marche uh, after the talk, if, uh, if possible. Uh, and with these armed forces, we cover land, sea, air, and the digital domains. The Dutch MOD has three primary tasks. First, defending our national territory and that of our allies. Second, enforcing the national and international rule of law. And third, providing assistance during disasters and crises. And we're also not spared modern day threats and subsequent problems. You don't have to read them, but a volatile geopolitical situation Increasing cyber attacks and influencing and unpredictable natural threats are some examples. In addition, we must look to answers for problems uh, such as hybrid warfare, a uh, shortage of personnel, and the risk of drowning in the sea of information. So with that, as the current state clearly defined, we want to direct our attention to achieving a desired state. A set of principles has already been drawn for us. Um, and for our efforts, we focus or focused um, on addressing the goals of achieving information superiority, providing multi-domain and integrated operations, uh, and being able to, to deploy both software and personnel quickly, scalable, and self-supporting. Now, we also have a clear vision of our desired state. We enlist the help of TNO to help bridge the gap between the actual state, the current state, and the desired state. And help us determine which steps we need to take um, or need to be taken um, and which technologies uh, we need to, uh, need to be explored. TNO is an independent research organization whose goal is to make knowledge applicable for uh, companies and governments. Our goal was to improve situational awareness and decision support through information superiority. And the most important parts of, this of the research program that followed and we, uh, we, we had was uh, a clear plan, what we would but also would not investigate and research, uh, the assumption that future command and control systems will be built and run cloud natively. So also the assumption that every vehicle, uh, be it land, sea, or air, will have a form of Kubernetes running uh, to facilitate this. And finally, the premise that we want to experiment as much as possible. So in a nutshell, how do we improve on collecting data and drawing a snapshot of a situation this way into deploying modern, high-tech, autonomous sensor platforms um, like you see here? leading to this kind of common operational picture. It's quite a challenge, 
even if you only look at the technological aspect of it. Because what we want is technology to help us create a concept in which software is flowing out, is sent out, and data, for example, uh, sensor data coming from vehicles returning from a patrol or a reconnaissance mission is brought back in. Where small adjustments based on fast analysis by, for example, on-site data scientists can be made at the edge, resulting in retrained models and then redeployed as software. And where joint multinational and public organizations can work and federate together within their edge or connected cloud context. And we're beyond that edge, at the edge of the edge, or what you could call the fog. Uh, independent drops are self-sufficient in their information gathering and analysis. And finally, where we know a tamed and controlled edge situation of chaotic, but alternately systems leaving and joining the collective we refer to as a federation of clusters and systems. Well, edge computing is a broad concept with different interpretations. The usage conditions and environments in which it takes place are generally the same or generally similar. Systems are designed with the premise that there is a stable connection to the cloud, but taking into account the situation in which this is not the case. This is where, in our opinion, cloud native software excels uh, in its resilient and adaptive properties. But we have to turn this around and use these properties from the assumption that we usually have a complete lack of connectivity, taking into account the sporadic occasion in which we have a sp possibly small bandwidth connection during physical deployment being away from a compound or, uh, or home. And while these principles for non-military and military um, uh, edge applications are likely to be uh, similar, the circumstances, conditions, and environments uh, are likely not, and tend to be more extreme and constrained in the military case. Some examples. Both edge locations. You could also think that both locations would benefit from computer vision, uh, computer vision models running. On the one side, computer vision models running to detect vehicles coming into a drive-through and enabling personnel or staff to help them. And on the right side, computer vision models uh, detecting vehicles approaching a checkpoint or a gate, enabling or, or activating personnel to inspect. Same use cases, vastly different locations. There's no cell reception far away in the desert. Another one where slow or a lack of information about traffic, uh, well, traffic doesn't really apply to the right side, but uh, routing, um, routing, positioning, weather, uh, and other information could endanger a happy customer and profit on the left side, but could endanger life and a successful mission on the right side. And both these bad boys want to detect vehicles and other relevant objects in their vicinity or remote vicinity. Now again, conceptual idea of the use case is the same, but the level of environmental circumstances and requirements and constraints are most definitely not. So, now that you hopefully have a good idea of the background challenges and ambitions for the story, we can fast forward to Kubernetes Cluster Federation and how it helped us realize this future picture. And when we talk about federation, we're not talking about the federation. Sorry, Jean-Luc. We talk about Kubernetes cluster federation, a, and I quote, multi-cloud or multi-region implementation for centralized deployment and management of applications and services across multiple Kubernetes clusters. And as with everything within the Kubernetes ecosystem, there is plenty of choice in tools and projects that meet this need. Anna will now take you down the rabbit hole of Kubernetes Tactical Cluster Federation and show you what we found. Thank you, Stefan. So let's think a little bit about uh, what uh, kind of, uh, sorry. 
what kind of uh, federation we would like. Uh, so here we call this tactical federation because really we want a set of devices that are somewhere in the field, in geographical location, in vicinity of each other, to be um, to create an ad hoc cloud uh, that would be um, uh, resilient, distributed, and collaborative. Uh, we, uh, for this kind of cloud, we have a few wishes. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, uh, we would like this kind of cloud to be able to regroup. So that means that uh, any vehicle could come or go. Uh, from the Federation without uh, affecting uh, the rest of the Federation. We would like the, um, the vehicles and the clouds to be aware uh, of its surroundings, uh, wherever it is a distance from each other or networking um, between each other. And we would really like to be able to observe the, the Federation, but from the point of view of a specific vehicle and not a bird view. So exactly how it is in the field, you only can see what you can see. Okay, so how would that work? So we have a simple scenario that we want to uh, take you through and uh, just to explain uh, what we have. So here we have uh, three clusters in the federated cloud. Uh, we have a cluster A, B and C. And now cluster A has quite a lot of computation, so it can compute something, uh, perhaps a bigger vehicle. And, um, but this, uh, this cluster doesn't really have uh, any data source. So it's looking for a camera in the area uh, to, to collect some uh, data uh, to observe the environment. So there are two, two cameras, uh, B and C, and uh, they are pretty similar. However, the networking conditions to, to one are better, to the other one are worse. And uh, cluster A would like to deploy a distributed um, streaming application. Therefore, networking conditions are important. So we would like to deploy this networking, uh, this streaming application from cluster A to B or C and stream. And that means we need good uh, networking condition. So we would choose cluster B for that. Now cluster B is, is chosen uh, and uh, network is uh, amazing, uh, but we know we are at the edge, so uh, we make it state, uh, stateful just in case. And we start streaming the data uh, in uh, back. Uh, we have application running on the cluster A and cluster B to, to facilitate the connection. All right, as we expected, uh, cluster B, its scanning pattern took it away somewhere behind the mountain and we lost the connection. And now the federated cluster is much smaller. So that means uh, we, have, um, we still have the cluster A, uh, which deploys the application, but what should the cluster A do? Like how uh, how long should you wait for cluster B to return? Uh, should you maybe reschedule this application? And what we want is to have an agreement between uh, two uh, clusters in the federation of how long they could be disconnected and how long is too long. And if the time passes, the cluster A can decide, okay, I really need this application, I'm going to reschedule it to the cameras that are available. And if the cluster comes back, within a specified time, we just continue streaming. No, like nothing happened because we are at the edge. So um, not really high expectations, right, from this use case, uh, totally reasonable for, for edge application. So let's see how, how we can uh, make it happen. So first wish that we had uh, that we talk about was that we want to join and leave the federation and we want this to be natural and expected. Um, so here we have a red federation and a car green is uh, part of that federation and then a car green would like to join another federation, leave and join another one and never come back. So that's what, uh, what is our wish, how it would look like. And now we tried uh, KubeFed for that. So KubeFed is a uh, create hierarchical federation, it's quite known in the community. Uh, so it has uh, two types of clusters. It has a host cluster. Oh, that's weird. All right. It has a host cluster and then two joint clusters. And hierarchical means that, uh, well, there's one more important cluster than the other. And that cluster will schedule applications on other. So use it as resources. Oh, sorry. So joining this cluster as a blue, as a green vehicle, it's, it's fine. It's as many as want can join. 
but now leaving the application the federation is slightly more difficult because if it's the blue one that leaves there's no federation anymore it's, everything is broken and then if another vehicle comes and would like to schedule applications somewhere also not allowed because we have two two heads uh, in this beast and that is not allowed okay so this is not really fitting our requirements we don't have this easy uh, coming easy going uh, functionality so we look for something else so we found this uh, cool technology uh, called Lico and uh, there we can create federation constellations so that means that you can um, create uh, just federation with one cluster next to you make an agreement of which direction you want to federate so you would like to provide um, resources or you want to consume resources could be bidirectional and then another cluster can create the same agreement with a different cluster and then you get the constellations of, uh, of agreements so you make a bigger cluster and then joining this uh, this is fine um, then the, if any cluster disappears that's also fine because the, the federation is peer-to-peer uh, -peer, doesn't really matter and then if another cluster appears that wants to join, everybody's welcome. Everybody can schedule whatever they want uh, as long as the agreement, peer-to-peer uh, -peer agreement is there. So that uh, fits quite well to what we want to do. So uh, you can check out this technology on uh, Lico.io if you want. Uh, perhaps even in the audience, there is somebody from Lico, because maybe not, okay. <laughs> maybe not this time, all right. Um, so we have, um, uh, several major um, major relevant legal concepts uh, that that actually helping to create these constellations the first one is uh, peering uh, so that's as i said this bidirectional uh, agreement between two clusters of what to provide how to connect what kind of certificates to use everything and this one uh, second one is a uh, network fabric and that's the uh, allowing pot to pot to pot and pot to service communication via secure channels Storage fabric allows you to defer the creation of uh, persistent storage on another cluster so that you not always have persistent storage on your cluster but can defer that to a, a remote cluster. And on the other side also data gravity. So if PV already exists on a specific cluster, pods will gravitate uh, to that PV to, um, for stateful applications. Uh, last thing, offloading, that's just offloading of applications to, to other clusters. One thing that is not really fitting this use case is that um, LIGO was created to, to connect computers, many computers in a university lab to boost uh, some uh, computation in that lab. So really uh, required reli a reliable connection and that we don't have so we have to figure out how to deal with that part of LICO but except uh, everything else is uh, quite fitting okay so let's consider our next wish and next wish wishes to to schedule um, pods tasks uh, with a consideration of uh, networking condition so as I said we have two possibilities to schedule tasks in the Federation and we just want to choose a better network and now, so that means we have to do something about scheduling. And then many of you know the Coop scheduler. Uh, many of you figure out somehow how pods are scheduled. You can also read about it. So there are, uh, there are two major steps that are important for scheduling. That's filtering and then scoring. And then you have uh, several, uh, several um, plugins that, that you can allow this uh, scoring to happen. All right. So now if and one of these is not network conditions. So therefore, you would have to do something about it to, to, to uh, make a scheduler. Um, so how do you actually make a custom metric scheduler? Well, you don't have to. Because first of all, the Coop scheduler is allowing extensions. So that means you can hook into to the plugins uh, and uh, affect the filtering and scheduling that are two most important tasks. And second one, um, well, somebody already made uh, uh, already made um, telemetry aware scheduling, and that was Intel. Thank you very much. Uh, so <laughs> that means that we can uh, hook up something to the scheduler, give it a metrics, and all we really need is this metric to reflect the uh, network conditions. 
So that's the only thing we have to do. And for this, we use optimized link state routing protocol, OLSR. And that's basically um, an algorithm that would tell you the state of all the links uh, that exist from, from your machine to other machines in the network. Um, not very, not many hops, only two hops, but it's sufficient for our application. So now we have a cost uh, in the network that we can hook up to the uh, to TAS and run with the scheduler. So basically, all you have to do in TAS is to create uh, a policy, um, custom resource policy, and uh, uh, you have to supply only three things. Uh, so um, schedule metric that would mean that you want to minimize your cost. So less than, that's a minimization. And then we have uh, two, uh, two rules, when not to schedule and when to deschedule. So we don't want to schedule when the network cost is above 600. Um, and we um, want to deschedule if we had a network metric, but the cluster left the federation, we uh, annotate this as minus one, and then you want to deschedule. And that's all you need to do. All right, and to figure it out, it took some time. So we have some uh, contribution from Elko and Johan, Johan here in the room, <laughs> to, to figure it out, put it all together so that the schedule actually works and that we can use it in our, in our application. All right, so uh, how do we put these things together? Uh, so we basically needed some kind of test pad to, to run this, to figure out, okay, those, all of these pieces that we selected, would it even work if we screw up networking? So what we did is build this um, uh, this um, federation of clusters. We built three clusters. Uh, we did a bidirectional uh, federation between them, deploy a streaming application, and then, um, yeah, screw up with the network. Okay, so I will show you how it's built from ground up. We have uh, two, uh, two VMs for each cluster. We build them with multipass. Then we use Terraform to install Kubernetes with already a uh, Kube scheduler as a scheduler, vanilla Kubernetes, nothing special. Then we install Lico and OSR. Now Lico starts working, and then how it works is that uh, it actually creates a virtual kubelet on each, uh, on, the, on the node. So that means it looks like you have just uh, very big uh, nodes here available on this cluster. So that means a normal scheduler would just choose one of these nodes to uh, to deliver applications, to schedule applications. And that would of course also happen on the other clusters, but uh, just too little space to visualize this. <coughs> All right, so now we have uh, Terraform that uh, replaces the scheduler, uh, adds the extensions to the scheduler. So now we have TAS as a scheduler. And then what happens is that uh, from, uh, from each um, OLSR, o OLSR um, application, we get the network cost. And then we also implemented uh, custom metrics adapter that would guess, get this metric and put it, uh, get, make it available to TAS so that TAS would always know what is the networking conditions between uh, those uh, two clusters. Okay, so now we use, now we want to screw up with the network. So we use chaos mesh to do that, um, allow it to, to de degrade the, the network. Okay, now we deploy our applications, also use Terraform for that because we want everything to be automated in this experiment. We don't want to click anything. Okay, so now the application is going to, as we said, to cluster uh, green. And now you can see that, the, that we have uh, this on the virtual node, we have actually shadows of the objects that we want to deploy. And this is done by the Lico resource reflection. And then actually the, the PV is created on the, on the cluster, on the green cluster. And we have a reflection here of the PVC uh, on this cluster. So now from the point of view of the, of the uh, blue cluster, um, we know exactly where the application is, uh, where the P PV should be on the other cluster. So we have a full observability of where are our applications. Oh. All right, now we want to uh, change the network again. We want to disconnect uh, green. Um, we do that with chaos mesh. And uh, while we disconnect green, uh, sorry, while we disconnect green, we, we can still see the shadow of the application. And then this application will not be rescheduled uh, because we can still see it. And we have this um, deferred and joining uh, that we set up that you can set up for any amount of time. It would basically tell cluster um, uh, blue 
uh, not to deschedule anything yet, but wait until uh, the time is passed. So the cluster connect again, the leak resource reflection kicks in again, and everything is fine. Uh, the application works as expected. All right, and this uh, testbed was made by Hirt. Um, yeah, all, all from the ideas to implementation uh, together with the team. Okay, uh, one more wish. I'm uh, almost over with my wishes. Uh, I want to really have the view of the federation from the point of view of one cluster. So all that one cluster can see, I want to see in the visualization. So that we, uh, we asked Clartia to make this and she did. Uh, so now I'll show you a video of uh, what we, we're going to see. So on the left side, you can see a command line. Uh, at some point, will, something will happen. And on the, on the left side, you can see a view of the cluster. So we are cluster blue. Uh, so we see ourselves. Soon we'll see other clusters. And here you can see uh, on the timeline what is actu actually is happening on the cluster. So all the events, all the pods happening, that will be visible here. And we have uh, OSR network cost. Uh, that is also a timeline. Okay, so we start. And we start. <laughs> and we don't. All right, yes, started. Okay, so we start with nothing. Then we key, uh, read Kubernetes API to find out what exactly do we have. And now we have one cluster. Now another cluster appeared, uh, we start pairing with it. Another cluster appears, we pair with it so that you can see we already have uh, virtual kubelets on, the, on our cluster. Now we also start getting the network information from the cluster. Um, and we can also see it on the graph. And now we decided that we want to decrease the network uh, cost on, increase the network cost on one, so that is the, to the yellow one it's changed. And we start uh, deploying our application. So now w the application is going on the orange cluster. Uh, it's starting, so part of it started on the uh, blue and part on orange, uh, because the network conditions were better on, on orange. So we started the application. All right, and we have data flowing from our streaming. Slow, slow streaming, but still. Okay, so not now what we're going to do is going to disconnect the, the cluster orange. We want it gone. Um, so you can see the network uh, cost went uh, quite high. And now we put it back. Uh, so the cluster came back and uh, now we can see it is uh, back to being connected. You can see here it's back to being connected. All right, and the data is flowing again. Yes, so that's that's it. That was the demo. Thank you very much. All right. Um, yeah, we're we're coming to to the end of this uh, of the story. Uh, we also learned a thing or two. Um, all, mem all team members have some wise insights to share. Uh, feel free to download the slides. They're already on the, on the SCAD uh, app, uh, so you can read them in detail. Um, bottom line is, is there is a lot of potential for federated cloud beyond the obvious. Um, in preparation for this talk, I asked my new best friend, ChatGPT, you know, what, what are some common uses of Kubernetes cluster federation? Uh, what companies use it and why do they use it? And he keeps coming up with, with lists of, you know, the, the, the big players with all, all the same use cases. So connecting multiple clusters over multiple uh, uh, geo locations or multiple physical locations. Um, we clearly seen, tested and experimented with a different approach, uh, which doesn't assume the, the natural behavior for, for cluster federation. Um, so that's, that's really interesting for us to, to see and to uh, to, to continue on. Um, and and an, another interesting one is that, and it's not very common for us, is that we can translate ideas we 
experimented and tested uh, in, in mission critical IT environments, and we can translate them back to our non-mission critical IT environments. Usually it's the other way around. We tested something, took it off the internet, tested it, oh, that could be applied to mission critical IT. Finally, we would like to give you a glimpse of our way forward. Uh, new knowledge building and research programs have already been started. The one um, that resulted in this talk uh, essentially uh, was, was, was ended to our satisfaction. Uh, so we started some new ones with, uh, with TNO. Uh, already new policy is being drawn up um, and we're seeing that our efforts are being continued to take this story to the, to the next level. And at the bottom of this iceberg, uh, you see some topics we will be researching in the near future. So trust and isolation are pretty important, obviously. Observability um, and power and temperature aware scheduling, or actually anything aware scheduling. Um, coining that term right now. Um, anything aware scheduling, because you can imagine that in a vehicle, especially when it's, when it's in, in an operation or on a mission, temperatures can fluctuate. Um, even when a vehicle is, for example, damaged, uh, temperatures can fluctuate, um, but also power, power consumption and power support. So that's, that's things we're, we're looking into. Um, if you got in some way motivated by this talk, feel free to reach out uh, to both me or uh, Johan, uh, also uh, present here. He will be uh, replacing uh, uh, Anna since she unfortunately left TNO. So feel free to reach out if you if you like the talk or if you if you think you can contribute or or if you wanna wanna share some uh, some experiences. Um, yeah, and finally, please rate this talk and give us some feedback. It's our first time speaking on KubeCon, um, so we can only get get better from this. Uh, I hope. Uh, yeah, and and absolutely finally, uh, we're also recruiting. Um, uh, like a thousand uh, job opportunities uh, coming up in, in, in May uh, for the Dutch uh, MOD in IT. So any Dutch people here, uh, feel free. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> any questions? I see we have three minutes. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. How do you deal with data federation and uh, replication across clusters? Yeah, so we try to replicate as. It doesn't really work. Okay. We try to replicate as little as possible. Uh, so, yeah try to not to use the network. Uh, so, that's why the data gravity, we use it quite a lot. So, if it's already on the cluster, yeah, we, we keep it on the cluster, and then you can have a replication on that cluster, but not across clusters, no. Yeah, yeah, so perhaps some applications that would carry data with them while they are being deployed on another cluster. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Right. Sounds cool. Hi, uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, first of all. Um, I was wondering, how do you handle this situation in case your edge device with a PV gets compromised? So somebody gets access to this device? Is there, how do you revoke the key or accessing your main cluster and how do you protect that PV that is in there? Thank you. Yeah, l like, like we showed you in the iceberg, this research is far from complete. So that's, that's actually, that's, a, that's an, an, open, an open question. Um, obviously we, we would be cryptomatically uh, securing stuff, but yeah, yeah that, that's, that's definitely an open question. We're first checking yeah, so the concepts so and uh, so we do yeah. use certificates and keys between the cluster so when there's a federation there's clear agreement based on keys and and certificates and that could be revoked but then yeah it's it ha have to wait for for check uh, to be revoked right but there's some other research uh, being done in other parts of uh, the world 
uh, that uh, that would actually allow revocation of this. Uh, so you have two levels of certificates, and one is revoked, and that you cannot use the second one because the first one is revoked. So you get instantly um, removed from the network. Yep. Yeah, it, uh, and I, I'm from Canada, so our federal government ah, is yes, also exactly. facing from Canada. That's <laughs> the right. same yes, challenges. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a couple of ways of doing it, and it's still being tested right now, so experimenting. Exactly, that. yeah, and then it's based on some kind of trust metric, right, that you could uh, yeah, evaluate and then decide in or out. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Thanks. All right, uh, that's it. Thanks, and have a great lunch. Thank you.